Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Brie Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. You can sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. You'll also find our new t-shirts in the shop, including podcast shirts and quote shirts from your favorite classic novels. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear what inspired your favorite classic author to write their novels and what was going on in the world at the time, check out the Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Today we'll be continuing Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Chapter 9. John Drett Comes Near Weeping The hovel was so dark that people coming from without felt on entering it the effect produced on entering a cellar. The two newcomers advanced, therefore, with a certain hesitation, being hardly able to distinguish the vague forms surrounding them, while they could be clearly seen and scrutinized by the eyes of the inhabitants of the garret, who were accustomed to this twilight. Monsieur Leblanc approached, with his sad but kindly look, and said to Jondrette the father, Monsieur, in this package you will find some new clothes and some woolen stockings and blankets. Our angelic benefactor overwhelms us, said Jondrette, bowing to the very earth, then bending down to the ear of his eldest daughter, while the two visitors were engaged in examining this lamentable interior, he added in a low and rapid voice, Hey, what did I say? Duds, no money. They're all alike. By the way, how was the letter to that old blockhead signed? Fab and toe, replied the girl. The dramatic artist. Good. It was lucky for Jondrette that this had occurred to him, for at the very moment, Monsieur Leblanc turned to him and said to him, with the air of a person who was seeking to recall a name, I see that you are greatly to be pitied, Monsieur. Fabinto, replied Jondrette quickly. Monsieur Fabinto, yes, that is it. I remember. Dramatic artist, sir, and one who has had some success. Here, Jondrette evidently judged the moment propitious for capturing the philanthropist, he exclaimed with an accent which smacked at the same time of the vainglory of the Montbank at fairs and the humility of the mendicant on the highway. A pupil of Talma, sir. I am a pupil of Talma. Fortune formerly smiled upon me. Alas, now it is misfortune's turn. You see my benefactor, no bread, no fire. My poor babes have no fire. My only chair has no seat. A broken pane, and in such weather. My spouse in bed, ill. Poor woman said Monsieur Leblanc. My child wounded, added Jondrette. The child, diverted by the arrival of the strangers, had fallen to contemplating the young lady and had ceased to sob. Cry, ball, said Jondrette to her in a low voice. At the same time, he pinched her sore hand. All this was done with the talent of a juggler. The little girl gave vent to loud shrieks. The adorable young girl, whom Marius in his heart called his or soul, approached her hastily. Poor dear child, said she. You see, my beautiful young lady, pursued Dondrette, her bleeding wrist. It came through an accident while working at a machine to earn six sous a day. It may be necessary to cut off her arm. Really, said the old gentleman in alarm. The little girl, taking this seriously, fell to sobbing more violently than ever. Alas, yes, my benefactor, replied the father. For several minutes, Jondrette had been scrutinizing the benefactor in a singular fashion. As he spoke, he seemed to be examining the other attentively, as though seeking to summon up his recollections. All at once, profiting by a moment when the newcomers were questioning the child with interest as to her injured hand, he passed near his wife, who lay in her bed with a stupid and dejected air, and said to her in a rapid but very low tone, "'Take a look at that man.' Then, turning to Monsieur Leblanc, and continued his limitations. You see, sir, all the clothing that I have is my wife's chemise, and all torn at that, in the depths of winter. I can't go out for lack of a coat. If I had a coat of any sort, I would go and see Mademoiselle Mars, who knows me and is very fond of me. Does she not still reside in the Rue de la Tour de Dames? Do you know, sir, we played together in the provinces. I shared her laurels. Selimine would come to my succor, sir. 
Elmire would bestow alms on Belsair, but no, nothing, and not a sou in the house. My wife ill and not a sou. My daughter dangerously injured, not a sou. My wife suffers from fits of suffocation. It comes from her age, and besides, her nervous system is affected. She ought to have assistance, and my daughter also. But the doctor, but the apothecary, how am I to pay them? I would kneel to a penny, sir, such is the condition to which the arts are reduced. And do you know, my charming young lady, and you, my generous protector, do you know, you who breathe forth virtue and goodness, and who perfume that church where my daughter sees you every day, when she says her prayers, for I have brought up my children religiously, sir, I do not want them to take to the theater. Ah, oh, the hussies. If I catch them tripping, I do not jest, that I don't. I read them lessons on honor, on morality, on virtue. Ask them. They have got to walk straight. They are none of your unhappy wretches who begin by having no family and end by espousing the public. One is Mademoiselle Nobody, and one becomes Madame Everybody. Deuce take it. None of that in the Fabinto family. I mean to bring them up virtuously, and they shall be honest and nice and believe in God, by the sacred name. Well, sir, my worthy sir, do you know what is going to happen tomorrow? Tomorrow is the fourth day of February, the fatal day, the last day of grace allowed me by my landlord. If by this evening I have not paid my rent, tomorrow my oldest daughter, my spouse with her fever, my child with her wound, we shall all four be turned out of here and thrown into the street, on the boulevard without shelter, in the rain, in the snow. There, sir, I owe for four quarters, a whole year, that is to say, sixty francs. Jondret lied. Four quarters would have amounted to only forty francs, and he could not owe four because six months had not elapsed since Marius had paid for two. Monsieur Leblanc drew five francs from his pocket and threw them on the table. Jondrette found time to mutter in the ear of his eldest daughter. The scoundrel. What does he think I can do with his five francs? They won't pay me for my chair and pane of glass. That's what comes of incurring expenses. In the meanwhile, Monsieur Leblanc had removed the large brown greatcoat which he wore over his blue coat and had thrown it over the back of the chair. Monsieur Fabinteau, he said, these five francs are all that I have about me, but I shall now take my daughter home and I will return this evening. It is this evening that you must pay, is it not? Jondrette's face lighted up with a strange expression. He replied vivaciously, Yes, respected sir. At eight o'clock, I must be at my landlord's. I will be here at six, and I will fetch you the sixty francs. My benefactor, exclaimed John Drett, overwhelmed. And he added in a low tone, Take a good look at him, wife. Monsieur Leblanc had taken the arm of the young girl once more, and had turned towards the door. Farewell until this evening, my friends, said he. Six o'clock, said John Drett. Six o'clock precisely. At that moment, the overcoat lying on the chair caught the eye of the elder Jondrette girl. "'You're forgetting your coat, sir,' said she. Jondrette, darting an annihilating look at his daughter, accompanied by a formidable shrug of the shoulders. Monsieur Leblanc turned back and said with a smile, "'I have not forgotten it. I am leaving it.' "'Oh, my protector,' said Jondrette. "'My august benefactor, I melt into tears. Permit me to accompany you to your carriage.' If you come out, answered Monsieur Leblanc, put on this coat. It really is very cold. Jondrette did not need to be told twice. He hastily donned the brown greatcoat, and all three went out, Jondrette preceding the two strangers. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today, while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. Again, my name is Brie Carlyle. And I hope you come back tomorrow for the next bite of Les Miserables. Don't forget, you can sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. And while you're there, check out our t-shirt shop. You can look in the show notes or on our website, biteatatimebooks.com, for the rest of the links for our show. We'd love to hear from you on social media. You can find us everywhere at Bite at a Time Books.